but there's so much to laugh about in the left right now, it's so silly. I know those people really well because I am those people and like I'm a social justice warrior and like, you know, I started a refugee charity and I'm like always campaigning on envir the environment and stuff and like, I'm white and middle class and I'm ridiculous and someone should be laughing at me more. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Jump the gun straight on me. Hayden Prowse, hello. Hi. How's it going? How's it going? Yeah, not too bad, mate. Yourself? Yeah, not bad. Yeah, yeah. You've been yeah. presenting a Radio 4 documentary. Yes. Green Ink. Yep. What's it about? Uh, it's about greenwash. So corporations, well, I mean, I guess pretty much every corporation on the planet right now will tell you how sustainable they are. Correct, every billionaire like Jeff Bezos, every card-carrying member of the Illuminati has some kind of net zero plan, it seems. And um, it's sort of breaking them down and working out which are kind of bullshit and which are real. Simple premise. Mm. How widespread is that problem? It's endemic, yeah. I mean, it's, um, and it's scary because it's, I guess, you know, I guess sort of 10 years ago you could have sort of taken it with a bit of a pinch of salt, but we're at this real sort of crisis point, right? And COP26 is, well, depending on your perspective, but failed. And, um, and we just don't have any more time to mess around. And one of the things I discovered in the research for it is there's, just, there's just almost no regulation of any of this stuff. There's some, you know, there's the ASA, the Advertising Standards Authority, there's the competition market. So there's, it's one of these things where it sort of all falls between the gap of, of regulation. Like the CMA doesn't know if the ASA is supposed to be picking it up and the ASA doesn't know if, you know, the trading standards body is supposed to be picking it up. And all these claims are kind of going out there and you buy your Ecova and you're sort of reassured. Nothing against Ecova, we didn't look at them, they're probably fine. But, you know, you, you eat your sort of, you know, your, your plant-based beef burger and you, um, you know, you get your sustainable recycled fashion and you kind of, in this sort of smug, cosy, you know, cloud of environmentalism that you think exists but doesn't actually exist. And it's really, really worrying because the problem's getting worse, but the environmental claims are kind of skyrocketing. It's interesting because, we, and we'll come back to the environmental side of things, but there's, there's a pattern here within um, sort of, I guess, capitalism. Uh, Marcuse talks about it, repressive desublimation. It's the, the co-opting of something's dangerous if there's an ideology or a concept or a movement that presents a challenge. Mm to the system, it co-opts it and it sanitizes it and it makes it less challenging. For key example, Che Guevara, right? Like, you know, communist revolutionary. Mm. Well, most people don't actually know who he is, but they recognize his face because they've seen it on a t-shirt. Yeah. And I guess something similar is happening with environmentalism. You have mm. a couple years of, you know, pretty provocative direct action from groups like Extinction Rebellion, mm. um, Insulate Britain now is pissing everyone off. Yeah. But then you also have Eon, you know, putting out TV adverts that are like, look how sustainable we are. Yeah. And they kind of, they neuter almost the, the, the criticism against themselves, don't they, by, by doing that? Mm. Yeah, it's really dangerous. And going into the doc, I was kind of unsure the line where sort of consumer responsibility ended and the responsibility of the corporations or politicians sort of picked up. But the more I kind of looked into it, just the more I realised how complex it was. And you, you literally need a PhD. I don't know what's sustainable and what's not from the research in this doc, and we did, you know, fashion, tech, uh, food and, and energy, and I still have no idea. It's just really, really, really complicated, but the people that do know are the corporations that manage these huge infra infrastructures and, and systems, although it's even hard for them to know, you know, the whole scope one, scope two, scope three thing, like, is, are you counting your own emissions or your emissions of your, of your suppliers? How far down the supply chain do you count it? It's really complex, and, um, it is all being left up to us and just no one has an idea. It's being, being basically left up to sort of hipster trends. You know, it's like, what's the new food fad in Hackney? Plant-based or is it gluten-free or whatever it is? That's what our environmental policy is as a nation right now. <laughs> Reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> <London Fields. laughs> um, energy seems pretty route one, but um, fashion. Tell me more about fashion. What are sort of the environmental pressures there? Yeah, okay, I guess the greenwashing fashion is recycling because there's been, a, there's been a lot of misinformation around cotton versus polyester. Obviously polyester is based on oil, petroleum, right? So inherently you can't decompose anything that's made of a synthetic material like polyester, but you'll walk into a store, even a store that you know, is really trying its best. You know, H&M is trying its best, but a lot of people still describe it as a fast fashion company. M&S is trying its best, but this problem does exist there too, where you'll kind of walk into a store and the, the, the garment says it's either recycled or recyclable, right? What's the difference between those two things? And if it's made of a mix of two different synthetic fibres, then you can't recycle it again. So that's the end of that, the life of that garment. Um, there's, 
there's BCI Cotton. I mean, it's just really, really depressing, actually. BCI Cotton, which is this WWF uh, approved sort of ethical cotton that all the big fashion brands use, was operating in Xinjiang, China up, up until 2019. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, slave labor, great. So, you know, environmental slave labor, fantastic. Um, COP26, you yeah. mentioned as a failure. Yeah, well, I just, what was it? I was just watching George Monbiot on it. Apparently there were more um, fossil fuel lobbyists in the room than sort of indigenous people from the countries genuinely affected. Mm -hmm. It's kind of mad, isn't it? And Best represented industry at the conference was the fossil really? fuel industry. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and isn't it the first time that the word fossil, f fossil fuels have been blamed for the climate crisis? It's the first, it's the first text that coal actually, actually features, the first time we're at the 26th iteration of it. It's now. absolutely nuts. It's absolutely crazy. And we've sort of put these people in, in charge, the people that caused, caused the problem. Yeah, I mean, the solutions exist, right? But we haven't, um, we could enact the solutions now, but we're not. And that's, that's you know, that's, is, yeah, that's business interests. That's, you know, and with the, the other thing we, the other episode is energy in the, in the series. And that's kind of mad. You have like, obviously Shell sponsoring the Science Museum, you know, which is a bit like Britain first sponsoring MOBOs. It's just insane. <laughs> you have like, you have, um, Fucking these adverts! You have um, you have these pop songs sponsored and paid for by Shell, literally with like pop stars, global pop stars singing about you know renewables and and solar powered energy and stuff. With um, what's what's the name of the woman in it? It's um, Pixie, not Pixie Lot. Pixie Lots in one of them. Yeah, oh, right. it's terrible. It's a terrible song. <laughs> <laughs> terrible song. And then there's. Um, yeah, they, they, they do these things like they send sort of polar explorers to the South Pole for the, like, the first ever renewable-powered expedition to the South Pole. It's like you're, you're like the 160th person to go to the South Pole. Just fucking put that money into something, <laughs> into, into more wind energy. Yeah, it's, it's insane. So those, those are the guys in the room, uh, which is sad. And we also saw the, the sort of the last minute sabotaging of the deal, China and India, the nuts and bolts of what happened, China and India sort of watered down the language to go from phasing out coal to phasing down coal. And yeah. you, ha you see this moment where the president of COP26, Alok Sharma, is sort of on the stage yeah. apologizing and he's almost, and I'm not sure, he doesn't quite cry, but he's sort of, he's on, mm. he's on the verge, he's very clearly emotional and on the verge of tears. I mean, did you, did you see that clip, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, it was, yeah, and then the, the Australian Deputy Prime Minister was taking the piss out of him, wasn't he? I don't know what Australia's offering to the planet at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, couldn't we just? Get, I'm half Australian, but couldn't we just get rid of Australia? <laughs> Seriously, uh, what are they offering? Nothing. It's a cultural and physical desert. All they, all they do is they're just sort of like spewing out. Per, isn't it per head of population? It's close to the US in terms of their carbon yeah. emissions. Yeah. It's drive around in SUVs, and they're quite good at brunch in Sydney. Brunch and casual racism is their, t their the two, two main two exports. Special, <laughs> two main exports from Australia. From Australia yeah. I am also half Australian, so you maybe playing to, play to the crowd here, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, but when you, see, when you see Alok Sharma, you know, crying like that, do you, do you, do you think that's serious? Do you think there's contrition <coughs> there? Do you think there's contrition there? Or do you think, do you, I think so. tears? Do no, you think I, I, well, I saw his, sorry, I saw a spot on you <laughs> and I've got COVID. Yeah, great. <laughs> I saw his, um, you might as well kiss <laughs> I saw his opening speech where he was saying that, uh, what did he say? You're, you're the new swampies. Do you see that? Where he was talking to all the sort of executives of BlackRock and the boardrooms and the politicians. He's like, you're the new swampies, who was the sort of, you know, activist from the, from the 90s who sort of chained himself to stuff. And it just felt really like piss taking and, and facetious. But then it, it, I don't know, like that seemed genuine. It's not like he was punching for much, it was just literally, let's get coal off the fucking table, let's recognise fossil fuels as the problem. And then coal sort of has been watered down, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, how can you not be sad? It's literally our life support system that's, that's in the balance right now. <sighs> Joyous. He's, he's probably got kids. Yeah, I'm sure he does, yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> Cheery. Yeah. We'll go somewhere else. Um, you're also the author of The Spectator's Wokey Leaks column. Yeah, was. 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 Tell was. me about that. Uh, well, Wokey Leaks was, it's like WikiLeaks, that was the pun. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was, I was Edward Snowflake, and um, it was an anonymous Proton Mail email account, which people would email woke stories, often from sort of um, corporations, right? So, you know, we got a leak from Northrop Grumman, which is. I think one of the biggest arms companies in the world, second or third biggest arms company, 
talking about how all the arms dealers were getting microaggression training. You know, we covered all the sort of gay pride celebrations of, you know, Volkswagen, all the biggest corporations on the planet in the West, whilst their Twitter accounts in Saudi Arabia were just dark. Mm -hmm. You know, happy Eid everyone and like not mentioning it at all. And just genu generally this sort of woke co-opting of, uh, the, the corporate co-opting of woke culture as a way to just sell more product, basically, which I find really disingenuous. And, it ha and, and it's interesting how uh, it was the spectator that wanted it and not any left-wing um, rags. Mm. And it's, I think there's been a bit of a dereliction of duty on the left as a lefty in relation to all this stuff, you know. The, um, what you're talking about, Nike, we can come to Nike, you know, one of the most evil corporations on the planet, debatably, is one of the wokest. And you speak to lefties about this stuff and they're like, yeah, but that's not our problem, that's just Nike trying to sell stuff. That's got nothing to do with the left. But it's like, this, these are our ideas, man. It's like, you should, you're, you know, you're asleep on the job if you're not going after them as much as, you know, you're going after someone that voted Brexit. So Hayden, people who may have come to you via revolution will be televised or, you know, seen your pronouncements about things, they would say, you're a left-wing guy, and then you're there sort of criticising your own, your own church. And may maybe there's a problem, people, you know, no, why are we spending time fighting ourselves and we should be fighting the right or the conservatives or whatever, but is, is it not just for yourself, did you find it a little bit surprising that you kind of found yourself in this position where you, where you were applying this criticism? Well, uh, f first of all, like, what I was doing in Revolution was comedy and was satire, and um, there's so much to laugh about in the left right now. It's so silly, and um, it just wasn't. I didn't feel like it was really happening. There wasn't, you know, you didn't see much on on the BBC, um, whether it was the Mash Report or whatever, sort of going after. It was all just Boris Johnson's a wanker. It was a like, way, and then everyone laughed, and it's fine. He is a wanker, so let's laugh at that. But there's so much to take the piss out of, and like, I know those people really well because. I am those people and like I'm a social justice warrior and like you know I started a refugee charity and I'm like always campaigning on envir the environment and stuff and like I'm white and middle class and I'm ridiculous and someone should be laughing at me more so I was so I just thought well let's um there was just so many jokes to be had and I don't know it's, it's funny that my people would have just taken themselves so seriously that they can't laugh at themselves anymore but yeah what's um what's your favorite story from the column well, there was the Northrop Grumman one with the, um, the arms leaders doing microaggression training, which I think was quite funny. I just, I, f I went to Davos a bunch of times and I just found that place hilarious because it's the sort of highest concentration of wealth on the planet, right? Up a mountain, surrounded by snipers and sort of Swiss military protecting the, all the world's billionaires. And it's the wokest festival on the planet. Every talk or debate is about, you know, gender equality. And it's like, it's like, what was the thing I said in the space, it's like um, gender neutral bathrooms on, on the Death Star, right? It's like literally this is what we're doing, we're sort of moving the chairs around and making sure everyone's equal and, uh, on the Death Star while the Ewoks are still getting blown up. It's a global south, global, global north problem and I think like, my, like um, it's very hard for people like us to recognise that we are the problem and it's very easy to make yourself feel better and get on social media and rage against Boris Johnson. Um, but it's quite useful to do a bit of introspe introspection. <laughs> always, yeah, always. Yeah. We'll come to that social media point, but I feel just for the sake of clarity, you know, when you're when you're taking the piss out of this stuff in relation to whether it's you know gender gender equality or racism, that doesn't mean that you're you know opposed to those causes. Hundred percent not. No. Yeah, yeah. I'm I, I am woke it, to the degree that I believe in all of the things that wokeness was created to sort of deal with and tackle, but I just feel like it's been co-opted by a sort of social media famous class. There's a, whole, I don't, there's a whole new class of people in society that are famous, right? Instagram and you know, Twitter don't release figures, I don't think, or Instagram certainly don't, but by some estimates, there are more people with sort of 50 to 100,000 followers than there are with like 200 to 1,000 followers on Instagram. There's a whole society of people that think of, them, that self-identify as famous. Perhaps we have more celebs now than we ever have done. Ever, yeah, it's like a Warholian nightmare we, we're living in. It's, it's come true. And, and it's, um, you know, they have a social etiquette and they have things that they all believe in and they sort of police themselves. And um, those, those idea, ideals and ideas are all sort of woke ideas and ideals. And um, they have, but it's, it's all very, the problem is, is it's, it's all within the context of 
Instagram and the Instagram algorithm. So it has all become about likes and follows and social justice is all through the prism of the most famous people on social media. So if you're Jamila Jamil, you dictate the narrative in relation to social justice activism. And um, it's not actually doing anything, is it? <laughs> I think we all agree. Yes, what I is think. it actually changing? If you, if you, like I make films for charities, sorry, I'm going on. If I make, I make films for charities, and if, if I make a charity campaign film, and that charity doesn't have any benchmarks or like KPIs in relation to their campaign, and they don't look back at the film that you made for them and say, did it achieve its stated goal or did it not? That's a bad charity and you shouldn't donate money to it. Social media, there's, there's no, there, there are no benchmarks or checks and balances in relation to how those activists online you know, campaigns are going? Like, are they having a net positive or a net negative effect? I don't think anyone knows. The word for it used to be slacktivism, didn't it? And yeah. now sort of clicktivism is the, is the kind of phrase that's, that's applied to it is, you know, um, the black square on Instagram is like the yeah. big, sort of like the, the obvious example where it's, you know, you, you posted something on, you, on your Instagram feed that day, so you can, you can log off and, you know, mm. your, your part in the fight against racism has been, has been done for that day. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, it's a little... It's a little bit worrying, but also kind of introduced an element of almost like like gamification, if, yeah. you, if you know what I mean. It's 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 there's a reward system in place, and you perhaps people do feel like they're making a tangible difference in the world, but really, what are they doing? Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely the case. Even, even I've got to say, even activists that I know that are actually doing a lot of good, it's almost impossible not to get caught up in the. Um, in yeah, the gamification, it feels really good to get likes and follows, but it's, compl it's a completely different thing from the actual campaign that you're supporting. Mm. But it's really easy to sort of confuse the two, I think. So to what extent do you think, you're talking about social media there, the other, the other sort of big thing on social media amongst this group of people is cancel culture. Mm. Yeah. I mean, first of all, first of all, your assessment of, of that and where we're up to now, because things are sort of softening perhaps a little bit in recent times. I think a little bit, yeah. I think one of the reasons I was, I guess my TV show was basically sort of, uh, you know, cancel culture <laughs> in the context of comedy. We'd like go and like, you know, do a prank on David Cameron or George or George Osborne or whatever. And even before that, I was like exposing people and, and stuff and like getting like MPs fired and stuff. I was doing that. And actually, like genuinely, I had a moment where I had to question whether or not I was actually doing anything constructive for the world or whether I was actually more into my own narrative and what a hero I was and like how I was saving the world and all this stuff. Everyone's drunk that Kool-Aid on social media. Everyone thinks they're the hero if they get someone, some mid-level person fired who tweeted something from 10 years ago. And at the same time, you know, there's very little in the press, that this, sort of this sort of, you know, culture war obsessed press about the exponential growth of the wealth of the billionaire class, 70% increase in their wealth since the beginning of lockdown, some two trillion they've managed to enrich themselves by. And it's not really, and Jeff Bezos is a sort of woke superstar, right? You go on his, on his Instagram and he's like a 13 year old private schoolboy that just discovered Noam Chomsky. It's all like, it's just so woke. You know, he, it's like, he's, yeah. And, and why is he not enemy number one? Why are we, why are we allowing, you know, every single, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio is hanging out with him at COP26. He should be sort of persona non grata in all of these places, the damage that his company does to the planet. It's disgusting. Yeah, and also should probably pay some tax. Would be the pay some tax, would yeah. Be the yeah. I'd like to start as well. Yeah. Good, interesting idea, windfall tax on all the profits made since the beginning of the pandemic, I think. Be That'd be good, yeah. Pretty good idea. Yeah. Um, on this, I'd just like to tease us out a, bit, a little bit more about cancel culture, though, because for me, there is, there is an element, isn't there, that someone does bad thing, says bad thing, whatever, faces consequences for their actions. Mm. You know, that is, that's kind of just like the marketplace of ideas, you know, you know what I mean? And I feel like the term cancel culture kind of envelops basically any, any, sort, of, any sort of person in position of power receives criticism, legitimate or not, and the, the, it's then described as cancel culture to mm. sort of delegitimize, weaken it, and we also lose a lot of nuance, I think. Mm. In, in, in the way we talk about these things, because, you know, what verse, you know, sort of the Harper's, Harper's letter signed by J.K. Rowling, Noam Chomsky, um, Gary Kasparov and a whole host of other people versus, you know, someone says like appallingly racist thing and therefore loses mm. their job. They're different things, aren't they? And it's yeah, a broad do you, term. Do you think J.K. Rowling was cancelled? I don't think you could say she's cancelled, no. Right, yeah. 
I guess she's not gonna. She's still gonna write more books, right? She's like the most read yeah. author in the English <laughs> language. Like, it's like, oh, you should be silenced. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't feel it. And again, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're cancelled, it's like, well, you'll be given a column in the Telegraph. You'll probably be able to write for Spectator, and you'll be interviewed by that guy on yeah. Unheard. So it's like, you know, to what extent have you been Could silenced? Be the best thing to resuscitate your career. No, for sure. Why yeah. I started writing for Spectator. <laughs> career was going nowhere, mate. <laughs> You're laughing, but it's true. Um, the, uh, no, it's true. Being cancelled can be the best thing for you if everyone stopped talking about it. You'd be great. It's what Piers Morgan thrives off, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but hold on, didn't she, wasn't it, but isn't, with J.K. Rowling, isn't it more that she just got a lot of hate, which is also another yeah. aspect of cancel culture? Yeah, yeah. Like people sort of filling up her Twitter timeline, and there's mm -hmm. kids on there with sort of really vile abuse. That is an aspect of it, which is pretty yes. nasty. Yes, yes. And again, I get it demonstrates the weakness of the term, right? Because when you, when you say to me, has she been cancelled? And I kind of go, well, no, because mm. she's still, you know, one of the most read authors in the world today. But also, again, you, you point out the, the abuse and the hatred. You know, both of those things probably do fall under that bracket, but, they, you know, they're, they're, they're quite different things, aren't they? And it's, yeah. The term has limited use, perhaps. Yeah. I, I, guess it's just this, I guess it's just really nasty when people... Uh, when lots of people are mean to you, <laughs> yeah, it's really horrible. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And um, no, no one wants it. But I remember, you know, I remember I did a film years ago before it did the revolution be televised, and I, I went, I set up a fake like um, mercenary company, and I went into a government department, and I like got some guy to agree to like do something illegal, which was to help me uh, launch my mercenary company in, in Iraq when I had a criminal record after Blackwater had just done that awful massacre. So the Iraqi authorities said, no more mercenaries with criminal records. And this guy was sort of t telling me how to. But basically, he, I, I released that with the Telegraph and he got fired. And then I was like, and nothing, there was no focus on the institution itself, the government department that he was part of, which he was just trying to do his job. And it, that kind of necessitated him sort of being a bit flexible with the rules, I think. I have no idea what happened to him. Like, could he meet his mortgage repayments? What happened to his family relationships? I have no idea. And it just seems odd that, because um, people do lose, I mean, J.K. Rowling's not going to lose her job, but there are plenty of people who have lost their jobs. It does seem to be that it's odd that people don't feel remotely guilty about that. When someone loses their job, it's awful. Mm. And I don't know. It's, um, there's, also, there's also this element that comes back to social media of whatever the issue is, whatever happens, people sort of pick their side, right? They, they, yeah. view, it, they view it through a lens. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, I think we're going to come, come to this point now because the other thing I wanted to ask you about the column, mm. story about Marcus Rashford, or well, actually in the end, no story about no Marcus, story. Ra yeah. <laughs> Marcus Rashford. Yeah. Um, you were kind, the WokeLeaks column was kind of subject to a hoax, right? Yeah. Tell, well, tell us what happened. We got so yeah. I've been like pranking people my entire life, and I finally got pranked. That's <laughs> cute. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. But we didn't really because someone came to WokeLeaks and said, "I've got a story wherein Marcus Rashford's management company have allowed the biggest corporations on the planet, like Coca-Cola and Nike, to co-opt the free school meals campaign and social justice for their own corporate agenda." Mm. And um, it's like great. It's a great story. <laughs> Um, and we sort of wrote it up, and there were lots of examples of this, right? Nike did do adverts off the back of the free school meals campaign, which I, sh I say in the, art in the article that never was never released, that I really support the free school meals campaign. I'm a massive supporter of Marcus Rashford's social justice uh, activism. I think it was fantastic, but I'm really uncomfortable seeing an advert from Nike where it's like a Nike-branded free school meals advert, which exists. You know, it's like Nike. Give feed the kids, the kids. Give, feed the kids. It's like you're using slave labor in China, you mm. fucking hypocrites. You're, you know, uh, Phil Knight, who was the C who is the founder and and um, not CEO. He's the founder. I don't think he's got an active role, but he's the biggest shareholder in Nike. Is the one of the biggest Repub uh, donors to the Trump Party in the world. He, I think, he gave, gave the single largest political donation to Donald Trump three months months after the Colin Kaepernick advert came out. Right. And like, so look at, look at Nike, like co-opting the Black Lives Matter movement and then donating to BLM nemesis Donald Trump. That, that, that is mad hypocrisy. And um, in relation to the free school meals thing, I thought that's interesting. So we wrote this article. Um, we were unsure about the, <laughs> we were unsure about the reliability of the source um, for various reasons, went to the wire 
didn't publish the article and then this um, prankster came out saying, I pranked the spectator by almost convincing them to write an article which the spectator never published. So it was an odd prank because it kind of failed. Mm. But then what was interesting was that, in fact, this, this whole thing was like a sort of pr um, an amazing way to sort of, it, it was a, an amazing case in point for the way in which uh, the sort of culture war works, right? Because Rashford tweeted initially about an article which was going to be written. The article, just to be clear, again, wasn't about him. It was saying Marcus Rashford's a hero, but Nike and Coca-Cola are trying to co-opt his social. There was another, you know, he did a Coca-Cola advert, Coca-Cola, one of the worst polluters in the world. It's in the Radio 4 series, you should check that out. But um, the article was about those corporations, not him, saying they shouldn't be co-opting his social justice movements, right? Rashford tweeted about this. Everybody picked their sides when the tweet went out. So every single person on the left was like, this is outrageous, the spectator are doing a racist takedown of Marcus Rashford. Everyone on the, on the right was obviously had the opposite opinion. And everyone knew exactly what they thought about this article that didn't exist. Then this prank came out and everyone again picked their sides about an article that didn't exist. And they knew exactly what they felt about it and thought about it. And yeah, it sort of went crazy on Twitter again, which was really interesting because I think that is how Twitter and social media works, right? It's like, how often does anyone read the article? I mean, this article literally didn't exist, but even ones that do exist, people only read the first paragraph and then they know what they think. And there's no, there's no nuance, and, it, and, it, and it's that nuance that you need because it's like, surely you should be able to say, like I was saying in the article, Rashford's a hero, love Rashford, but there are, there's a problem here, which is like, why isn't Rashford speaking out about Nike as well as about the Tory government? You know, there was that, NBA player the other day that um, wore those sneakers on court saying made by slave labor. Oh, right. Yeah, he wore a pair of Nikes on court saying made by, uh, made by slave labor. And that was brilliant. But I think you should be able to, we should be able to have enough nuance to give positive criticism to our social justice heroes, you know, maybe. What's happening for Wokey Leaks next then? You said it wasn't a spectator. Uh, I don't know, it might be, maybe spiked. Maybe the Guardian wants it. <laughs> <laughs> he says optimistically. <laughs> yeah, um, Hayden Prowse, we'll leave it there at the death of nuance. What a, a cheery place to leave things. Um, but thank you very much thanks for your so time. Much. I've really appreciated it. Thank you.